Thank you for joining us today. You are here for our uh, Wednesday afternoon lightning talk session. Uh, so each of our four presenters are going to get 15 minutes to speak on their topic. So I will start by turning it over to Kieran from Invika and feel free speakers to introduce yourself as you come up. Hi, <laughs> I just watched my colleague Constantine do a presentation in the auditorium, so it helped my nerves just having to do it to you guys. So what I want to talk about is uh, the big news in Drupal 8, which is the adoption of Symfony components. <clears throat> and kind of, why is this a good idea? Why Symfony? There's plenty of frameworks out there. What's attractive about Symfony that makes it a good idea to pull these components into Drupal? Is it that the Symfony guys are like these geniuses with massive brains who churn out perfect code? Um, that's not true. I know quite a few of them. They're normal like the rest of us. But there's one thing that does kind of um, make Symfony stand out from some other frameworks. And that is the architecture. <coughs> so this is from a blog Fabian, the main architect and maintainer of Symfony, wrote three years ago, I guess. Um, <coughs> and when he was trying to describe what Symfony 2 was, he didn't say Symfony is an MVC framework. Symfony is a reusable set of components um, that are decoupled but still cohesive that solve common web development problems. He goes on to say, it's also a web framework that's one way of plugging these components together to build websites. But the sort of initial starting point when we're developing a Symfony component is to say, how can we make sure this is modeling the problem it's trying to solve well in a way that's going to be reusable in other non-Symfony projects and have clean APIs and clean separation of concerns. So uh, one of my colleagues, Jakub, did some research on adoption of Symfony 2. So he, this is in February this year. He wrote a blog post, which you can look at in your own time. But he crawled across Packagist and looked at what uh, dependencies all of the projects on Packagist have. And 20% of them were relying on Symfony in one way or another. That's a huge number. It might be slightly skewed because maybe Symfony projects are more likely to use Composer or use packages, but it's still a big chunk of projects in the world have some kind of symphony in them. When you look at how they're relying on symphony, there's about 5,000 packages. Um, about 2,000 depend on the framework. So that's say explicitly are a symphony web framework application. That's about 40% of that 20%. About 20% depend on Symphony Symphony, which just means everything. Everything in the Symphony framework. The guy who wrote that package didn't think hard about which components he's going to use. And 40% of them depend on very specific components of Symphony. So there's a huge number of projects out there that are Symphony reliant that aren't Symphony web apps. They're taking the components from Symphony that they think they will use. Okay, and that is kind of the approach Drupal's taking. Drupal isn't being rewritten in Symphony, the web framework. Drupal are looking very carefully at what components Symfony offers and saying which of these components will be useful to us to save us time, to allow interoperability with other projects. Okay? Because what shared components give you, adopting components from another library, it gives you interoperability. It gives you the opportunity to write code that can be used across different frameworks. It gives you hiring benefits. Someone who's been working on Symfony stuff, when they come and work on a Drupal 8 application, a lot of the concepts and APIs they're using will be uh, familiar to them. So what I'd like to do is um, illustrate this by looking at, there was going to be one component, but then I realized it was actually two components. So two components from Symfony that are being brought into Drupal they're in the Drupal 8 beta when I looked. Um, they dropped in about alpha 4, for those of you who are tracking the alpha builds as a kind of moving target. And I want to explain what these components do and how the fact they're being adopted by Drupal offers opportunities to interoperate with Symfony. 
So we'll look first at what does a web application actually do? What do web applications look like? And it's a really simple model, right? An HTTP request comes in, that's what makes it a web application, and eventually an HTTP response gets returned back. Unless you seg fault in the middle and nothing happens or your server dies. And this abstraction is true for all web apps. So having different frameworks modeling this side, the request, and this side, the response, differently from each other is a kind of duplicated effort. The HTTP requests my Symfony app deals with is the same things that your Drupal app is dealing with, unless they change HTTP. So inside the HTTP foundation component, there are objects that deal with these. We have a request object and a response object. And you don't have to think they're the best way of representing a request and a response. There are things I don't like about them. But the fact that work has been done in the Symfony project, and it's completely decoupled from the rest of the framework, means that any, any application that needs to model an HTTP request, an inbound HTTP request, it's a really good idea to use this object. It's an object you may have used before on a previous project. It's an object that does a good job of modeling an HTTP request, and there isn't over time gonna be changes to that domain. Even when we look at HTTP2, the kind of concepts we're modeling in the code, things like cookies, headers, uh, HTTP verbs, they're all gonna be stable. You don't need to reinvent your own request object, right? Same with the response. The bit in the middle is the interesting bit, your application. So Symfony provides kind of two elements to deal with this. The most important one from the Drupal perspective is an interface. So Symfony framework, Symfony web framework has an object that represents what an application looks like. But it also recognizes that not everyone wants to buy into the way Symfony web applications are built. Other people who want to build their applications a different way. So it also exposes an interface. It just describes how applications work. How do applications take a request and output a response? The interface looks like this. Uh, hands up if you're a developer. Okay, great. I'm gonna show code, I got a bit worried. Uh, the interface looks like this, and all it really defines is that you have to be able to handle a request and that's going to return a response. That's how a web application works. It's very closely aligned with the domain we're dealing with. The other stuff is more complex, but don't worry about it. And if you look at a Symfony web application, this is what the front controller looks like. This is the file that everything rewrites to, the index.php, right? It's at PHP and Symfony, but all the requests go through here. We do some stuff at the top to get a Symfony application ready called a kernel. We make a request. So it takes all that dollar underscore get, dollar underscore post, cookie stuff, and wraps it in a nice object. And the job of an application is to handle a request and return a response. Then you send the response out to the user. If you look at Drupal 8, this is pre-beta. This is like the last alpha when I wrote the slide. It's doing the same thing. You can see the similarity, right? You make the request exactly the same way. You wrap all that PHP stuff into an object. You then get the Drupal kernel a different way. So the details of how you get a Drupal application ready are different to how you get a Symfony application ready. But fundamentally, all it's going to do is the same thing. It's going to handle a request and return a response, and then we send that response out to the user. So, so far, so good. This, this model, this sort of common model for a web application has been adopted very widely. Symfony web applications do it. Silex applications have the same interface, Laravel apps, um, Drupal 8 now, YOLO, which is kind of a joke framework. Uh, PHPB, PHPBB even has started adopting this model for request response. That's like a 15 or 20 year old application. They're, they're moving towards this. Um, WordPress are thinking about it. I think it's the latest. But what's the benefit of having this shared model? 
is the hiring stuff I mentioned. There's the familiarity. There's the fact that you know the, there's less rework. There's less reinventing of these concepts. I think the reason it's a great idea to take that simplicity component is because it doesn't come with a load of other concepts. You can just rely on the HTTP foundation component to provide a model for requests, responses, cookies, sessions, that kind of web stuff that's never really going to change. It's going to change quite slowly as different HTTP versions come out. But introducing an interface has one massive benefit in that as well as having these hiring decisions and design uh, benefits, you also can develop code that is independent of the framework. So the domain we're talking about is requests coming in and responses coming out. There's a whole set of problems that can be modeled using that metaphor without caring what happens inside the application. Not everything, but by... Um, by having this nice, clean interface that everyone's sharing, there's a lot of stuff you can do. So here's an example from Symfony. Um, there's a lot of logic in Drupal about full page caching. How do you cache your responses? Symfony doesn't have any of that built into Symfony. It's actually very rare to do it in software. Um, the preferred approach is to have an HTTP <coughs> cache in front of your app and just don't worry about doing full page caching. If you want to do it in software, this is the approach you use. Use an object called app, ca app cache. You get your Symfony application ready. This is the same as the previous slide. And then you pretend that this new thing is the kernel. So you wrap the actual application in a caching layer. And then the rest, the request response stuff, is all the same. So this, anyone know what design pattern this is? This is the decorator design pattern, right? So you've got your internal logic of what your application does, and then around it you're wrapping a layer that does the caching. So some requests will just hit the cache and bounce back because it, the cached version is served. If something isn't in the cache, the inner kernel will get invoked and its response will be cached. What it's done is it's added full page caching to a Symfony application without making Symfony more complicated. This app cache object can be reused with any of those other frameworks. Okay, so this is built into Symfony and it got a few clever guys thinking. Maybe we should use this approach more. We've, we've, we've been able to implement a full page cache that works with any framework that uses this interface. So it will work straight out of the box with Drupal 8. What else can we do? They called it stack. It's hard to define what stack is. It's just a kind of mindset really, and a set of conventions. There's, no, there's very little code. And the stack project curates a lot of these um, objects, and they decided to call them middlewares. So something that's going to use the decorator pattern to wrap an application and do something where it either fiddles with the incoming request or fiddles with the outcoming response. So here's an example middleware like, that you can write yourself. We implement the kernel interface, so we're going to pretend to be an application. And when we're asked to handle a request, what we're going to do is we're going to ask the real application to handle the request, and then replace its response and add a new header, DrupalCon rocks. So we're going to replace the contents and then return that modified contents. So I can wrap that around any Symfony app or any Drupal 8 app, and it will add this banner. So imagine you've got five, um, five ongoing projects on different <coughs> frameworks. It's one piece of code. You can apply it to all of those projects to add the banner. OK? The way it looks is this. The kernel is wrapped in a cache, and the cache is wrapped in our new object. So it will exhibit caching properties, and it will be adding this stuff to the output. The stack guys have done a great job of um, linking out and curating a list of other useful middlewares. So cookie guard is really interesting. Your application thinks it's just setting plain text cookies. And then wrapped around it is a layer that's intercepting all the outgoing cookies and encrypting them, signing them. And all the incoming requests, it's decrypting and validating signatures. So your app is, thinks it's just setting cookies in the massively insecure manner. 
Uh, this is from the Laravel community, but CookieGuard is encrypting all of them outgoing. GOIP does GOIP lookups, so as far as your application is concerned, users are helpfully including what country they're in in every request. Uh, you can do a bunch of other stuff. Last thing I'll mention is when you use it in Drupal, there's a problem. <laughs> I said when you, to apply one of these middlewares, you wrap the kernel, uh, which would involve editing index.php, which isn't something Drupal developers are happy doing. Uh, because it's part of the framework. It's owned by the framework, it's going to screw you over when you try and do upgrades. So this has been merged into, um, it, it's made it into the beta. You use the service container, which is a different Symfony component, you register these middlewares. So you just say, I've got this promoter and my app should be wrapped in this. You can have a whole list of them with different priorities, each one adding something to the application. And the last thing I'll show, this is an example of two separate applications. I have a Symfony application and I have a Drupal application and I've merged them into one code base. And I can use this another third party uh, middleware called URL map that says all the requests are handled by Drupal unless they start with blog, in which case hand them off to the Symfony application. So something you're doing in software, you don't have to configure it the web application. Uh, so that's it for me. I'm Kieran. I've gone a minute over. Uh, I contribute to PHP spec. I'm a trainer at the Invika Group, we do a lot of training in Symphony. And come and see us on Stand 309 if you've got any questions. Thank you. Just a small warning this is no technical session uh, because there were three really heavy stuff. Uh, this is about uh, what we are building for the Flemish government. It's a CMS system based on Drupal. We want it to be very user friendly. I'm just going to show you where we came from. Um, first, this is how the average website and uh, the, the average Flemish government website looks like. Um, this is a, a typical example of being made in iPublish. Um, there are a lot of CMS systems used. There are 35, around 35 CMS systems that are being used in Flanders. There are like 20 hosting providers. Um, there are about between 500 and 800 websites. Um, so there were two guys at Flemish government and they had this idea of standardizing uh, and, and, and industrializing, industrializing the concept of one global platform to realize all the government websites. Um, so we started, um, we, two companies, ESN, and, and it's, a, it's a communication agency. One agency is a uh, web integrator, uh, also Drupal shop. And we hooked up, we created Paddle. It's a company, it's the name of a distribution. And um, we started working on Kenyu. And Kenyu is the name of the Flemish government. The guy, the client is in the room, so I need to be very polite. Um, and we started thinking about what we are going to make. So we started, um, we looked at the, the Drupal multi-site solution, but that wasn't scalable enough. Then we looked at the Drupal distribution, that seems a valid option, and then we thought, oh, Perhaps we can fake it with a fake Drupal Dev Factory. Um, we opted for the most scalable solution. Um, that's a Drupal distribution. And what we have made is basically an infrastructure where we can create fee hosts, just put the distribution on it, and we take it from there to realize websites. Um, what is it now? Kenyu is basically the distribution with a lot of theming options and a sort of app store. Um, we call it the Paddle Store. So it contains all these kind of little functionalities that can be wrapped in, in a Padlet, gets added to the store, so it makes it scalable. Uh, also future-proof, we can invite pretty much every developer to make an, 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 a Padlet, uh, wrap some functionality, add it to the store, and then um, open it up to all these websites that the governments want to have. Um, what's in the system even more? We have some um, four roles right now, just plain simple, uh, a webmaster who has the functionality of the teaming and the app store. We have an editor-in-chief who is responsible for the publication of content. You have editors who cannot publish anything but can prepare uh, the content. And then we have um, a read-only role, and that's being introduced because there was some kind of necessi necessity of uh, people validating content that cannot touch the actual content. 
Uh, what else is in there? Um, we can create pages, simple, plain simple. I will show that later. Uh, we have um, centralized asset management. Um, we have um, links to a website taxonomy, navigation structures. We have publication options. Um, we are responsive. It's still a work in progress, but we're almost there. And we built everything with accessibility in mind. Um, I'm not saying it's perfect, but at least we're trying to help also the blind to use the system. Um, one of the latest releases we had um, was the education website. Um, it's kind of a big project. They almost worked two years on it. Um, a lot of people were involved, and they launched it last week. Uh, two weeks ago, we had uh, Energiespar, um, which is an uh, energy saver website uh, made with the same system. And uh, one of the first customers was uh, OVAM, the, the Flemish garbage company. Um, what's special about them is that they work with uh, 90 editors uh, on a daily basis in the CMS. So um, if they can do it, uh, it's pretty performant. Um, what we also saw is that a lot of people um, use a system without, uh, without what we had foreseen. For instance, the, these guys of Audit Flandern, they, they, they work very visually. Um, this is the typical landing page in Kenya. I will later show and demo how it works. Um, but what you can do is really think visually. You can add any, uh, you, can, you can add blocks with custom content, with images. You can add uh, navigation structures. You can have listings based on taxonomy terms, etc., etc. So it gives a pretty flexible, configurable uh, installation for non-technical people to use. Um, I just uh, took a, a live website. Okay. Um, you log in as a normal user, and then you come into the back end where you can see the pages that are being created. It has, um, it's in Flemish, sorry for that. Um, and everything that's related to the workflow. So uh, a page gets created, needs to be approved by an editor-in-chief before it can be published, and then it can be published. Um, we have the team store. The team store there, you can create different kind of um, uh, look and feels for your website, and you can pre preview them on your live website. So this is the active team. Uh, and then you can scroll to a couple of themes that you try to make just to see if it works, if it doesn't work. Um, also something that we are pretty proud of is that from any page within your website, you can directly go to an admin view where you can edit it. So if you see a full, uh, an arrow on your website, you go to the page, you edit it, you publish it, and it's solved. Um, pages are really simple to make. Um, we start in the base distribution with two types of pages, basic pages, landing pages, and the other pages are being um, added to the panel stock, which I will tell later about. Um, a basic page can be easily created. Up. You can add content in it. Uh, you have a title, the body, um, taxonomy terms that you can select. Um, you have uh, SEO optimization, all texts. You can place it in the navigation. Um, this one is pretty different from what you're used to. You can say, hello, I want it to be placed in the main navigation. I create a menu link and you can position it directly where you want it. So I want it, for instance, here. You can save that, and it's created. Um, you can also schedule, like I said, and we added the page responsible because in, in, for the government it's quite important to know who's responsible for what page, apparently. Um, what else? Um, I said, oh, I'm going to do this first. Uh, the landing pages is basically it's grids where you can put blocks in it. Um, these are paints, um, really simple. I'm going to create this page. Up. Same, same principles. And instead of adding content, I can fill up regions. 
regions. It's a bit smaller. Voila. And there you have all the types of content that you can add in blocks. Uh, page content, contact persons, uh, navigation structures, images, lists, contact forms, etc. Um, the pedal store. The pedal store is basically where we gather all the external, uh, the added value functionality. There will be uh, a business model in which we will add a lot of fee, free features, uh, but it's possible that we will uh, also try to ask for money when using third-party applications or um, custom applications built for uh, specific clients. Um, what, what you do is you just install a Padlet. Sometimes you can configure it on the, the app itself and sometimes it adds a bit of functionality in the base distribution so that you can use it for instance like the pages that uh, the contact person page etc uh, structure also very easy to manage taxonomy easy to manage um, just by clicking dragging dropping saving and it works um, Um, so how do we do this? Um, we have a great team um, and great processes. They are built together. We do everything um, really, really, um, really great, actually. Um, these guys over there, um, they're the, from the start. We do retrospectives almost every month where they can say what's on their liver. I don't know how it's called in English. <laughs> um, but they can say how they can, uh, they can add um, improvements to the processes. Um, they, they sometimes have uh, remarks about the building, but also in processes, very technical discussions, etc. Um, what's also important is that we took the wrong, uh, the wrong, the right partners on board. Um, they evolved a bit. Um, we're working with Nucleus for hosting, for instance. Slack is the latest tool that we added uh, for internal communication. Uh, we can really recommend it. Uh, also, the devs are really, um, yeah, find it very useful to ask small, short questions. And then, last but not least, we have um, the most amazing clients. They know that they're stepping into a platform that's unfinished, that keeps on evolving, that sometimes contains bugs. Um, they help us making this work by reporting them. We also have co-creation meetings every two weeks where they uh, give us input on how to make stuff. Um, we prepare it, of course, and then we show it, we demo it with uh, clickable wireframes. They say what they miss, and then we go back to the drawing board, adapt it, and start developing. We have a very lean development approach, uh, very test-driven also. A lot of time is being put in, in um, avoiding regressions. We made a mistake last year, and I re regretted it uh, a lot. So now everything is really needs to be covered before we release it. Um, releases are every two weeks. So we keep on developing, continuous releasing. Um, every two weeks, we put in production what's ready, what's been covered by testing. If it's not ready, then it will not be released. And the only thing um, I can still add is we're really aiming to create the best CMS in the world uh, for non-technical governmental people um, on a no-fail hosting platform. Any questions? No, oh, that's good. Um, if you ha if you have any questions, okay, yeah, go ahead. How how compatible is the distribution that you have built with Vanilla Drupal? Uh, it's it's. I'm I'm going to give the word to a technical guy for that. Um, Peter, perhaps.
do we create the wrong service? So I would pay it. All right. Um, just one last thing. Um, we also um, we know that the, the yeah we experience for the end users to use, and um, this is the first thing um, that we are going to do. It's really to create some more airy atmosphere in the interface. So what we do with Kenyu is is make it really simple for end users to use. All the functionality that Drupal offers is mostly hidden because. I, it just confuses people, um, and that's what we try to avoid. So thank you. The database, this is something which we are just using underneath, and we are not basically interested in technical details. So I thought, well, what is the key message of my presentation today? And I was thinking about, well, who knows the name of the dolphin? of MySQL. So this dolphin is called Sakila. So whether you are interested in my presentation or not, you probably want to stick with the name of the dolphin of Sakila. And we've got some plush dolphins on our table. So this should be one of the key takeaways. And I would like to speak about MySQL as of today and what will probably start or what will be uh, the next versions of MySQL and the near next features. My name is Carsten Thalheimer. I'm located um, nearby Frankfurt in Germany. I'm part of the so-called uh, Oracle LVM GPU, which means Linux virtualization in MySQL, and my focus obviously is MySQL. Now another crazy slide is the safe harbor statement. To be honest, uh, everybody's using it within Oracle. I'm not exactly sure what the background for this is, but I think it basically means I can tell you everything and you cannot sue me. So everything that I'm going to tell you can be true, but probably not. So. I think that's from a legal perspective, that's everything. Now, let's come to some of the facts. So MySQL is owned by Oracle now. Uh, Oracle took over Sun, Sun took over MySQL. And when Oracle took over Sun, there was a kind of a feeling that Oracle will probably close down the MySQL product. This is probably the second most asked question since yesterday. Well, probably it is true, probably not. I don't know, I'm not Larry Ellison, but basically some of the facts which I'm going to present you probably makes you believe that Oracle does not have bad things in mind when it comes up to MySQL. So for example, when you look at the uh, engineering stuff and the QA stuff, and when you do a direct comparison as of today towards 2000, end of 2009 when Oracle took over Sun, well, most teams are doubled or tripled, some of them are even more stuffed than they are at 2009. So there is some stuff going on. And um, we're still hiring. So in case that you are interested in working with MySQL, we've got about 50 positions open. So go to Oracle and, well, do just double check the pages in case that you're interested in. So how does development work within Oracle? So let me start with this hasn't really changed since uh, Sun uh, acquisition of MySQL or Oracle acquisition of Sun Microsystems. So basically when you're using a MySQL product as of today, it basically falls into one of these five regions and it's probably you're using the code, you're building your own database, which is still possible. This is true for even the next version of uh, MySQL, which will be released 5.7, which is not GA as of today. It is still true for the 5.6, which is the GA version and it's even true for the um, releases from the past. So this is a kind of the open source version. And by the way, uh, we had a big event this year called the Oracle Open World, which still takes place in the US this week. And as part of this Oracle Open World, we are announcing a lot of new stuff, a lot of new features and changes to the product and so on and so forth. And since uh, probably mid of last week, uh, you can find the MySQL code on a GitHub. So they changed the model in a way that they are internally using the Git infrastructure and all the open source code of MySQL is available on GitHub now. Well, this is true since last week. And in the development phase, uh, when we are interested in certain feedback for features, uh, we call it a lapse release. A lapse release is probably nothing what you want to use in a production environment. And this is probably uh, the same for the so-called development milestone release. The development milestone release is a kind of the main code, the main MySQL version. And when you want to have a feeling about benchmark and features and so on of the next version, you probably want to look at the development milestone release, which is the third one. But still, this is nothing which we are going to support as MySQL because it's probably too early. 
In case that you're interested in using MySQL in a productive environment in combination with Drupal or other applications, you're probably looking after the community version or the, commu uh, the commercial version of MySQL. And when you look at the database technology, the database itself, they are 100% compatible. So it's probably only the licensing uh, um, README stuff which is different, but from a database perspective, the feature perspective, it's 100% equal. And this is true since Oracle. So again, whether Oracle has something bad in mind for MySQL or no, I don't know exactly, but um, it doesn't make sense in case that they have to. So, and um, again, it's the fifth year now. And uh, since the Oracle acquisition, we re released all these products. So you probably can't read them, but I assume you get the presentations anyhow later on. So I do not want to go into details with all the products. I think the, the main ones are probably uh, at the right side. And the one where I want to get your attraction on is a very small binary. I think it's about 20 or 30K. Uh, it's a thing called the YUM Linux repository. So um, I just asked the second, most second asked question since yesterday is, well, will Oracle close down MySQL? And as that, I don't think so. And probably the most asked question is about scalability with MySQL and issues with Drupal or other stuff. Now, um, one of my questions, which I'm always asking is, well, which version of MySQL are you using? And most of them I hear 5.0 or 5.1. I rarely hear 5.5 or 5.6, which are the actual versions of MySQL. And this is an issue because scalability was highly improved, especially in the later releases in the 5.5 or 5.6 release. So my strong recommendation is to use a late version. Now, when you are using Linux, Red Hat, Ubuntu, Debian, or whatever, you probably want to stick with the versions which are part of the Linux distributions. This is not the recommendation what I would like to give you. I would like to give you the recommendation, well, use the repository and use the latest version which is available because we are still evolving the product, we are still working on scalability, and especially when you're coming from version 5.0 and you're using 5.6, I would be really interested to see how much faster MySQL is because I expect it to be at least three or four times faster. So one of the first things when you run into scalability issues is, well, use a late version of MySQL and a very, very easy trick to use or to get to the latest version of MySQL is to use the YAM Linux repository, which again, is nothing really new. It's available since a couple of uh, months. Now, we are today with 2014. We still have a lot of stuff which we are developed. As said, most of the products are released in the last 10 or 15 days. That is because of the Oracle Open World, which is the classical period of MySQL to announce new products, and that's where we are today. The latest version as of today is the release 5.6.21 or the release 5.5.14, uh, in case that you're interested in it. Now, um, Scalability. I already mentioned that scalability is one of the key questions uh, which I'm getting. And the question is, does MySQL scale? And to make it short, normally it does. Now, these are the figures for the release 5.7. Um, 5.0 or 5.1, they are even not mentioned anymore. They are probably in the area of a kind of 5,000, 6, So therefore, by just using a late version, you probably get a much better scalability. And with every new product, we are evolving the scalability of MySQL, so you should not have a big issue. The same is true for the next question, which is based on the NoSQL interface. Since release MySQL by version 5.6, we do have a NoSQL interface as well. This is based on the Memcache product, and usually it gets a kind of 10 times the performance as when you're using SQL. But uh, one of the key takeaways here is that there is a NoSQL interface available for 5.6 and for 5.7 as well. You probably want to use it um, in case that you need this kind of scalability. So these are the kind of the releases uh, where you see the presentations. As I said, the Oracle Open World is still ongoing this week. So some of the presentations are done and you can follow them in the internet. And the product or the release where I want to put my focus on is the so-called MySQL Fabric because it's very rarely used. And um, I would like to give you an idea what the Fabric is about. So basically, replication. So my first question is who's using MySQL in this room for Drupal or for other applications? Okay, that, it's close to everybody. Now, who's using replication? Okay, that's probably half of them. So, in case that you need scalability, or you need uh, HA, high availability, or other functionality, you probably use a technology called replication. 
you've got the master and you've got a slave. All the reads and writes can be put to the master server and it's replicated from the master to the slave environment. So basically means that you've got a couple of dozen servers, but you still have one master which is re responsible for keeping all the other databases up to date and therefore all the write requests are basically just going to the master. So this can be an issue, especially when you are a company like Facebook or Google or whoever. Uh, it can be even an issue in case that you have a big database. So what we introduced um, in spring this year, it's a thing called the MySQL Fabric. The MySQL Fabric is a standalone component. It is open source. It is available as a GA release. We just have the second or the third release announced this month. And there is a difference uh, when you compare the replication with the Fabric. So from an application point of view, there is a connector. The connector connects to the database. So long, you probably have seen this picture. Now the difference is that before the connector is putting something into the database or is reading something from the database, there is a new technology called the Fabric. And Fabric is basically a kind of the stakeholder. So the Fabric tells the connector where to connect to and where to send the information to. And this is an interesting model because you can easily build huge databases now. So let's have a look at the second one. So I do have two farms now. I do have two applications. The applications are writing the information to the connector. The connector wants to write the information somewhere. Now, before the connector is writing something to the application, it is asking the fabric where to send the information to. And one of the valid answers is that please send information to the left master plus to the right master. So I do have two copies of my databases. Uh, in addition, it can do load balancing. In addition, you can do sharding based on sharding keys with the application. This is, as I said, pretty new since this year. It's called MySQL Fabric. And there is a high dependency on the connector. So as of today, we support uh, Python, Java, PHP.net. We do not support all of the connectors right now. That is ongoing. So for example, the C connector, the so-called LibMySQL, uh, LibMySQL client, is not supported or it's in, uh, in alpha mode as of today. But this is a song going forward in case that you are looking at HA or big databases. Uh, you can do it with MySQL and you should have in mind that there is a PHP connector and therefore it is available for Drupal as well. So when you want to have HA, very easy HA, this whole fabric set is set up in about 10 minutes or something. Um, well, just use the PHP driver, the newest one, the, the PDO version and just connect a couple of MySQL instances and have two or three times uh, the data set as a replica of the my, uh, MySQL environment. As I said, this whole set is set up within 10 minutes or something. It's rather simple. You just have to have a couple of instances and you should have the way, an easy way of uh, HA. When it comes up to sharding, it's a bit more complicated, but that's kind of the second or the third step um, anyhow. So some of the key benefits, some of the key takeaways for Fabric. Well, first of all, it is available. You can download it. Go to mysql.com. You will find it. Uh, it can run on a MySQL instance. It can run on separate server as you prefer. Keep in mind that it is probably a single point of failure. So probably you want to have uh, two instances of the Fabric running. Uh, but everything is in place. Everything is there. Everything is documented. Um, use it. Um, all the replication technologies which you can or which you know already can still be used. So this whole fabric thing is based on replication. The only requirement here is that you are using the MySQL version 5.6 because we are relying on the global transaction IDs to make sure that the databases are in sync. So uh, in case that you are using all the databases, you can't use the fabric, but starting version 5.6 and the newer version 5.7, which is still in alpha or in beta code, uh, can be used with Fabric as well. And as I said, a kind of free of charge thing which you get is you can chart your database e easily. And um, as I said, it relies on replication. So everything what you know already about replication can still be used going forward. And in case that you run into an issue, it's a kind of the on the, on the fly thinking. So when you need resources, when you need more IO, when you need more network, well, you just add a second server, a third server, a fourth server, uh, and as that, it, it, it's rather simple. Um, in case that you have questions or in case that you want to see a demo or something like this, well, um, the questions, we are at table 405. Uh, we, we do have a MySQL banner. It's probably easier to find the banner than the table. But um, yeah, in case that you have questions, either ask them now. I think we still have time for one or two questions. Sorry? 
40 seconds? Okay, then I stop immediately. Questions? If not, well, please visit us at table 405. So, one question, please. Yes. No. Everything is based on the InnoDB storage engine and even the uh, NoSQL one based on the memcached is based on InnoDB. You can, in fact, address the same data so with two ways, with SQL or with the NoSQL based on the memcached one. Okay. Thank you very much. Does know something about MongoDB. Uh, as my colleague from, from Oracle just said, uh, I had to reshape my, my slides a little bit from what I drafted before coming here and, and, and last night. Actually, I spent a lot, lot of the night in, in reshaping it because all the questions that the guys that came through our boot uh, asked us in some way gave me an idea of what the way you're using MySQL or MariaDB with Drupal. Uh, so this is the, the main reason why uh, I want to, in some way, address my presentation to what I think uh, Maria DB will do for you to help you. Uh, first of all, I'm Maria Luisa Rabiol. I'm from MariaDB.com, MariaDB Corporation. Uh, just new, we used to be SkySQL till yesterday. We just changed our name tonight, last night, uh, from uh, SkySQL to MariaDB Corporation. SkySQL was founded in 2009 after Oracle acquisition of Sun from the same uh, founders of MySQL itself. So with my friend, we are almost cousins. <laughs> uh, we, have a, uh, we have a very strong team of MySQL experts. So actually, uh, when SkySQL was founded and Monty Program left uh, uh, Oracle, uh, was founded after Monty left Oracle. A lot of, of the core engineers of MySQL left and, and joined Monty uh, with the new project. Uh, we do provide them uh, as a company um, part of, of the code, a lot of the code of for MariaDB that's not owned by us. MariaDB is owned by the, uh, a foundation, so it's not something that we own. MariaDB Corporation is something that provides services around MariaDB. And we also we have this strong core of uh, uh, the team of, uh, of experts and engineers around that. Uh, MariaDB is becoming more and more popular. It is uh, adopted by a lot of uh, community, of the community drivers. And we have very interesting customers in terms of people that are adopting MariaDB and using MariaDB in, in their own uh, um, um, premises. So, what is MariaDB? MariaDB is a, a, an enhanced drop-in replacement for MySQL. This means that in terms of, of using it, uh, it's binary compatible with data, so you just switch off the server, the MySQL server, install MariaDB, and just start the server, and that's it. It's more or less like doing an, an upgrade of a, of a version, from a one version to another version of MySQL. Uh, as I said, we, we just support it in terms of MariaDB Corporation because it's not owned by us. The, the, the strong point is that we still want uh, MariaDB to be an open source project. Uh, so that's why Montevideo uh, wanted that uh, no company was the real owner of, of the code but a foundation. So just to put it in a safe, to, put, to be sure that there was not possibility to be sold again. Uh, and MariaDB is becoming more and more the leading database platform for cloud. Uh, as you see, a lot of uh, open source community is switching uh, uh, from MySQL to MariaDB. Uh, just to, to mention what my colleague just said before for MySQL, when, it, when, it, when you mentioned that you need to upgrade for, for what you, you get from the distribution. Actually, most of the distribution are now distributing MariaDB instead of MySQL. So if you want to upgrade, you really need to remove MariaDB and install MySQL. So it's, a, it's, a, it's becoming the default of the LAMP stack uh, from these uh, um, vendors. So uh, the point is that I wanted to tell you what, in my opinion, is a uh, uh, the good part of MariaDB that can help you uh, with, with your Drupal-based application. Uh, Drupal application. 
Um, MariaDB is part of the, of, the, of the Drupal setup process. So when you install Drupal, uh, MariaDB is, is actually one of the choices that you can pick from, from, from the database part of the installation. Um, as I said, is, is being a drop-in replacement is it's like a no-brainer. Just, just replace it and use it. And uh, in terms of uh, differences, this is the main question that, uh, that we had yesterday and today from, from people that came to the booth. Say, so, oh, this is a new flavor for MySQL. So what is the difference? Why should we pick this one or that one? And uh, of course, uh, I just prepared this slide to show you what are the, the main difference that we think uh, in some way make the differentiation between MySQL and MariaDB. Uh, we support more storage engine if compared with the default storage engines than MySQL support. We have specific storage engine for a specific task. Uh, we support ExtraDB that uh, is a drop-in replacement for UniDB itself. Uh, I think it's, come, it's coming from Pacona, but we work together on this storage engine to improve the performances, and, and, uh, and, uh, and we think this is much more performant than, than UniDB at the moment. Uh, well, we can see the list of the main differences. Uh, mainly, main, the most of them are related to uh, the optimization part and some new features that are MariaDB specific. I will go through some of them to show them what we think are the most uh, relevant for you. Uh, ExtraDB storage engine. As, as I said, it's uh, our default as a storage engine, like you know, DB is the storage engine default for, for MySQL. Uh, in terms of performances, uh, we, we, it, it, the, um, there are, it's, it's more relevant because the, in terms of it and the disk, I mean, we have, uh, a better performance is when we have to, to, to write on the disk. Um, and in terms of if you, I don't, I don't know if you are running uh, MariaDB or, or your database in the cloud, but uh, in terms of, of using the, the, the InnoDB buffer pool, we save the buffer pool, uh, actually we save the buffer pool, so taking off and on nodes is much faster because you take what was stored in the buffer pool every time that you switch on and off a server. Um, it's backward compatible with InnoDB you know, again, so it's easy to switch from one storage engine to another. Uh, is any one of you still using my ISM for the tables? If so, please don't do it unless you really want to, uh, because my ISM is a great storage engine. It, it has been a great storage engine, and it's still the faster, fastest storage engine available, but you have to handle it carefully. If you know what it's doing, it can be your friend, but if you're not really using for, the, for what it has been designed and used, you can run into troubles. Of course, it's easy to, it's easy to break it, it's not transactional, uh, so it's, it's fantastic if you have to do a lot of inserts and, and insert a lot of data, but it's not really uh, reliable in terms of transaction. Sphinx storage engine. Uh, if anybody of you is using Sphinx, uh, now, in MariaDB, Sphinx is a, a storage engine like all the others. This means that you can take all the advantages of Sphinx without uh, having to go outside of the database. It means the data stored in Sphinx storage engine inside MariaDB are, are handled the same way all the other data are handled. So you can use the search engine of Sphinx and use it in join with other tables for MariaDB. So it's really transparent the way you can use it. So we take, you, you can take the most of things and, and, uh, and uh, of the other things of MariaDB. Uh, I will go fast, I'm sorry, but I want to cover some, some, some other things that can, might be interesting for you. TocoDB, is anybody of you familiar with TocoDB? Uh, TocoDB is a, it, is, it used to be a, 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 a closed source sort of storage engine till last year, then it has been released as open source. Uh, it's, Pretty similar to InnoDB in terms of structure, is a transactional storage engine, but the, different, the main difference is uh, on the way it deals with indexes. Uh, it does not refer to uh, B3 structure, but the, it, it uses a, a fractal index uh, structure. Uh, this is pretty convenient if you have a lot of writes and you hit to this a lot, because uh, uh, the way it, it accesses the data being uh, this way to use index much more um, efficient is really fast. Uh, TocoDB also use data compression, so it's uh, 
really interesting if you're running uh, your, uh, your database on a, a server that uses SSD, you can have fast compression and decompression from of your data. So it's something that if you are in this set of, of option opportunity, you, you should think about. Connect, uh, new storage engine for MariaDB, MariaDB 10 is a, a very nice thing that uh, a lot of our customers really love. It allows you to connect uh, external data that can be any kind of extension, more or less, that just lists the, most, the more relevant, uh, as if they were local data in a local database. I mean, you can access an XLS file, a CSV file, or any other files uh, outside your database and handle those data like as if they were local. Thread pool. Thread pool is probably uh, something that uh, you would like. Uh, because for what I'm, I'm not a, a, a Drupal expert, of course, but uh, for what I know, and every time you connect or a customer or, or a user connect to a Drupal website, uh, there are a lot of small things that are written on the, on the database. And this set of connection and, and writes are, are really expensive in terms of uh, uh, efficiency. Um, all the queries that go back and forth to the, from, from the users to from the client side to the database can be expensive in terms of threads. Any threads that's, that's uh, alive can, of course, uh, uh, affect the performances of the system. Uh, with the thread pooling or the thread pool, you can uh, create a pool of threads that can be reused and all the future connections will use uh, already open connection. So this will dramatically increase the performance of your system. Um, it's easy to, to, to switch from not thread pool to thread pool, just changing a simple parameter in the configuration file. So it's something that uh, if you're in this kind, uh, uh, if you're in this situation, I, I would suggest you to, to, to try and use. Subqueries. As I said, uh, when, when uh, Monty Proga and MariaDB company was founded, uh, all I would say most of the optimizer uh, team, engineers from the optimizer team uh, left Oracle and, and joined Monty in the Monty program team. And uh, the big effort they've done in the first few months was to rewrite the optimizer for MySQL. Uh, this means that the subqueries now, now are really uh, effective, they work, and if you've been uh, experimenting uh, the way the subware used to work or work in the past for my MySQL, you know that they were normally not working. So uh, the only solution was to, to split them to, to use several set of, of select and then join and then say. now they're working. They're working mainly because uh, ReadyDB has uh, this uh, uh, subware cache. This is working pretty pretty well and. To, to, to be correct, also MySQL 5.6 has now a, a new, um, um, more performant way to, to use, uh, uh, to um, support and, and uh, support side queries. We think that our, our, our solution is a bit more performant than MySQL at the moment. Group, of, group commit. Uh, the idea with the group commit is to allow you to condensate a set of, of transactions in a single commit instead of hitting the disk any time that you have to, to, to send a commit to your server. Uh, this allows you to hit the disk less, and of course any time that we, that we hit the disk is time consuming and, and of course the performances are affected by this. Uh, if you are using replication, as I, as I see some of you are using, uh, this also can also be a way to improve the way you replicate because with MariaDB we also have different way to do replication and one of those is parallel replication that takes a great advantage of the group commit. This means that all the transactions that are executed in groups from the master will be uh, replicated in groups uh, to the slave. So this will reduce the time uh, to, to, for, the, for the slave to catch up against the master. So this is something that in some ways is uh, a win-win solution. GIS, I don't know if some of you is using GIS. Uh, GIS it has been a uh, bigger for, for, um, for um, MariaDB in the last month. Um, we now have full open GIS support. Uh, this is becoming more and more interesting for, uh, for all of our customers that uh, want to do 
uh, want to develop solutions that have maps or solutions powerful through uh, and also how to, to, to connect one place to one other being routed to a specific point. In the past, the, the implementation for MySQL and, and MariaDB was pretty rough, so uh, not really satisfaction. Uh, the, the customer weren't really satisfied. Uh, now it's, it's uh, really um, complete and effective. Uh, I've heard before that a lot of, 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 of person asked uh, MySQL and us as well about, uh, about uh, scalability and uh, I availability. Um, I, know, I know that many of you and many of people who are uh, developing um, Drupal solution, they are not uh, uh, really responsible for the database. They just sometimes connect to something that's already there. And what surprised me a lot is that you don't, especially also from, from the poll that my colleagues just did, I'm done, <laughs> okay, uh, you don't know what, what, what is happening on the other side. Give advice, give advice and also don't, don't rely on a single server. On a single server it's becoming a very dangerous single point of failure. So think about replication, think about availability and uh, just to build safe solution. You are responsible for your solution sometimes, so think about all these things. Uh, skip, skip, skip. Uh, <laughs> okay, I think, I think I'm done. Uh, just this. Well, you have all the slides, uh, some references refer to the knowledge base for MariaDB. Most of the information that I have to uh, run through are there. Uh, my name is there, you will have the slides, and yeah, use this uh, as a reference to see if some of the things that I have listed can help you for, to improve the performance of your database. Okay. <laughs>